Okay, good morning and thank you for joining in for our uh, class week six. Thank you to all those who join in through the e-learning portal, who watch the video and respond. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Let's just start with a word of prayer and we'll get ready into class. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you have allowed us to see another day. Thank you for your mercy, for your grace over us. Thank you, God, that uh, you shower every good thing for us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for uh, showing us, God, that all things come from you. We pray that we will walk in faith, Lord, all the days of our life. We submit our class today. We pray, God, even as we start a new chapter on skills, we pray that you will empower us, equip us uh, in bringing up ways and learning ways of how we can connect and um, make people feel loved, cared, understood, as well as challenge them, Father. Thank you for teaching us through these through these days. We ask that you be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So welcome once again. Um, uh, just uh, quickly to, uh, to bring about a recap of what uh, we did the last week. We went through the uh, stages in the counseling process over the, the week, last week as well as the week before. We started off in talking about the three uh, stages. We spoke about the stage of exploration. We broke that down and saying, when we begin to explore, we're also looking at assessing different areas of uh, counseling's life, as, uh, as well as getting to the second part of identifying what the problem is. So we take time to identify the problem. And as we're doing that, we're also helping to identify uh, um, the certain goal that they, th that they do a certain, I mean, what is the goal that we can ascertain through the behavior that is being shown and uh, helping the counselee to come uh, in to understand and to recognize their uh, beliefs or the thinking that uh, that will further show us what are the strategies that underline the problem. We also spoke about how <clears throat> through that stage we assist the counselee to personalize their problem and so thereby when they personalize their problem they also attempt to personalize their goal. The second stage we looked into was understanding, uh, self-understanding, where the, the new goal, uh, the counselee is helped to change these problem-causing beliefs and come into further new goals. It's a process of re a process of re uh, changing or disputing, challenging their wrong beliefs and replacing it with something that is new, something that is in tune with the Word of God, in harmony with the Word of God. And um, also during that time to enable them to discover their feelings, help them to face it, help them to discover newer ways of how they could express their negative feelings, which, which is in a way spiritually, which is in a way helpful. And also see how these changes can reflect in their um, thinking, their feeling, as well as their behavior, so that you have a commitment in the five areas of functioning we spoke about. And the last is uh, action, taking action, where you're initiating interventions, initiating different uh, uh, ways of how a, a, a counselee could solve their problems, um, and also helping them to implement, implement those steps. And finally, uh, a way of termination is what we looked into. Okay? So even through these, uh, these stages, so this is what generally happens um, through a counseling process. Now, in order for this to happen, uh, uh, the, the even as the counselor helps the counselee go through these different stages, there are certain skills that the counselor requires to enable the counselee to go through these three different stages. You may not expect that a counselee will do stage one, stage two, stage three without a guideline or a direction from a counselor. And that's that's exactly what um, uh, the counselor is built up. is also all about um, the counselor using certain skills to bring the counselee to a place of understanding, to a place of action. So that's what our next 
um, chapter chapters are going to be. And I'm on page uh, 30, and we're going to be looking at these different kind of skills that a counselor needs to use to help the counselee move through these three stages, um, through these processes. Once we are done with the counseling process, I will show you, um, you know, I will bring about a, a diagram that helps you understand how, uh, how with the, with the counselee, counselor, um, using these, uh, these different skills, how a counselee is moved from one stage to another, the stage of exploration, understanding, and um, action. So we will go through the entire skills on what are the skills that a counselor needs to be used through this process. We'll go through that. And once we're done with that, I will show you a diagram that will help you understand, uh, that will put these two together, the stages as well as the skills. It will put this together for you to know that it's as important for us as counselors to be well versed in these skills, to learn how to um, work with these skills so that the, the best outcome happens through the counseling process. The therapeutic relationship uh, uh, is, is a lot more tighter when you do that. Okay, So we're going to be uh, looking at um, the first skill, which is uh, attending skills. Kindly give me a minute. I'll just uh, ensure that I put on, I just shared the, yeah. OK, so uh, the first skill that we are going to be looking at is the attending skills. Now, before we get to understand what, uh, what these skills are, uh, this is what we call as something that we call as the micro skills. Now, what what before we understand each of these skills in place, we we did see that the strength of the relationship, bet, uh, the the counseling relationship or the therapeutic relationship, is actually the quality and strength of the connection between the counselor and the counselee. Okay, so what does the uh, all of counselling consists of these two things, the way the counsellor relates with the counsellee and vice versa, the way the counsellee relates with the counsellor. So it is in the midst of this relationship that change, that intervention, that exploration happens. Without a strengthening of this relationship, you could, you could probably assess that um, counselling may not be as effective. You would have probably seen uh, or, or heard of people Who've uh, who've told you that you know they uh, they haven't had a good counseling experience, right? And some of this could be as a result of the relationship that is there. So the relationship between the counselor and the counselee. So all counseling relationships do consist of these two relationships: the counselor's relationship with the counselee, as well as the counselee's relationship with the counselor. So uh, what do you how does this pan out? It really shows you the, the kind of um, interactions that happen in building this quality relationship is extremely important within, within counseling. Okay, So it's just not the content that we are looking for, but it is something uh, more, which is what we call the micro skills. Now, when we're looking, uh, when we understand this word called micro skills, we're saying, that the, the skills that the counselor employs in which the movement, where there is movement for the counselee, is what is what, what is really matters. So the micro skills, which is what we're going to be learning, is that are those things or those skills that the counselor employs to bring about movement for the counselee through the process in counseling. So that's why understanding these micro skills are very important so let's let's just look at what do we mean by by micro skills now let me give you an example okay suppose you're driving and the engine of your car has stopped what would you need to get it working again let's suppose you're not someone who knows too much about cars i mean you can open the bonnet and look at it and that's a, that's as much as you can do you may see smoke coming but more than that, you have no idea what what you would want to what you do. Okay, so if if your car broke down, what would you need to get it working again? 
So one, you may need to take it to someone who is skilled to work on the care of your car. OK? You may require the right kind of tools to open the engine, uh, you know, to fix some loose wires or parts of, or, uh, you know, take away the battery and add in something. So you need certain tools. And third, you would you will need to activate certain some form of condition, like maybe you need to change your car battery or you need to add distilled water or take your car through a conducive condition to get it to start working. So there are different things. Right? You need someone who is skilled. You need tools and you also need some uh, some good conditions. Now, counseling. Similarly, counseling is when people come who are hurting, those who are hurting. Um, and we need to use certain skills. OK, there are certain foundational skills that are needed when you're counseling somebody. OK, there may be certain tools that uh, that that is that brings about the success of 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 what of the outcome. OK, certain tools that you're using. And it also requires that there may be certain conditions that help them to open up and get involved in the process. So there may be certain condition where that looking internally happens or personalizing the problem happens. So just like any other situation, even in counseling, uh, that's that's why you know um, be careful when lay counselors take up uh, cases, because uh, sometimes we go without skills. We think we do inherently have those skills. But but we may we may not we may not know how to use them. So it, it's important to have skills. It's important to have good tools and have an environment that is conducive to this, uh, um, conducive to the to the to the building up of the relationship. Now, why why should we have these skills? You know, is, why is it why is it enough that you know when someone comes with a problem, we just tell them how to manage the problem and send them away? Well. That's like like we mentioned, counseling is not about uh, giving them advice, right? It's about helping them to be able to come up with uh, understanding and 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 a way of working and an action point for themselves. So why is this used? Why should micro skills? Uh, why are micro skills necessary? So counseling micro skills are generally when you look are specific. Uh, skills that one that a counselor can use to enhance communication. There are some things that you need to enhance your communication, right? And these skills, what do they do? They enable to effectively build a good working relationship with the counselee and engage them in a discussion or in a conversation that is not just helpful, but also meaningful. So when you look at micro skills, they are observable actions of the counselor. They are things that you will see the counselor do that will have a positive change in the session uh, through active listening, where both the counselor and the counselee are engaging it. Right. So they these skills are something that you will notice that a counselor is doing intentionally in order one to build a good relationship and also to engage the counselee in a conversation that can be meaningful and helpful. So uh, you use it, you, you're actually doing, uh, what you're doing is you're actually learning uh, a new way of communicating or a more intentional way of communicating as you do this. OK, um, what I want to do, I'm going to be, I'll um, show you all a video uh, first of, um, maybe a first clip, first part of the clip, and then later, maybe at the end of the class, I'll show you the better way that how it's done. And after the video, I'd like you to observe and tell me what are some of the things that you notice that the counselor um, is being disastrous in, OK? So let me just put that video up.
Okay, is everybody able to see this? Yes. Yes, okay, all right. Joanne, how are you? It's good to see you. I'm okay. Um, yeah, I'm okay. I just wanted to, to come in and talk to you today about a new issue that, that I had come up with my husband. And basically, it seems like every time I, I try and plan, <coughs> excuse me, every, yeah, go ahead. Um, every time I, I try and plan like time together between the two of us, he'll go off and do something else that, you know, is just totally irrelevant. Like he'll go and play his games or he'll start texting with a friend, or he'll start watching a movie. And it's gotten to the point where I really am starting to question, does he value our time together? Especially if he's just engaging in all these tasks that are completely... Oh, excuse uh, me just a second, Jim. Okay. It's my phone. Okay, sure. Oh my gosh, I have a text message. Yeah, um, I just, just one second. Okay, yeah, I was just right in the middle of telling you that story, but I guess that can wait. That's really important. Well, thanks, I'll, I'll just leave my phone here just in case another one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I should. Well, maybe I shouldn't leave it here. Maybe I should kind of put it here. Okay. No, but actually, you know, I think I really, I might be. I, I'm expecting an important call from my daughter, so I okay. doubt that it'll come in while we're talking, but just in case. You know. Okay. Well, yeah. Was this a good time to schedule my appointment with you? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay. So, like I was saying, um, I'm I'm having issues with him with us being able to connect in our free time and. And it seems like he's just not prioritizing that. And I don't really know what to do about this. Are you kind of warm? Um, I, I am a little warm, hot. but yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah, I'm be comfortable. Yeah. Do you want to take your jacket off or anything? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Um, I should really try to turn down this heat, but I'm not quite sure how to do it. But it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think you noticed uh, that the counselor was doing that, uh, yeah, maybe let's look at first what the counselor was doing and then we'll reflect on what did you notice of the counselee? I think the counselor needs a counselling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what else did you notice? The behavior of the counselor was disturbing. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. What, what? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Devi. Go ahead. Yeah. The impression uh, that she was giving us uh, the counselee, what she's saying, and the person who's uh, like she's not, she's not of primary importance. Like the, the impression that oh, you're not that important, but the. The call is important. My comfort is important. Or uh, even the mm -hmm. appointment time that is given to uh, her exclusively, uh, even mm -hmm. that uh, that her time is not respected uh, because mm -hmm. the appointment is for her, but mm -hmm. it's not respected. I feel. Okay. Good. Good. Any other observations? Uh, yeah, I think she's not giving any focus to the country. She's okay. not listening, just, uh, yeah, it doesn't give, I mean, when you go to someone and you know that they are listening, that makes you to tell something. So yes. she's not paying attention to anything, not listening. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you, what did you notice about the counseling? What did you notice? About the counseling? Yeah. I felt that she's very uncomfortable. She she's uh, uh, she's trying to say something and then <laughs> something else happens. So even she's not able to put up the words right. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. In fact, she asked. She said, "Was this a good time to set up an appointment? Uh, you know, uh, maybe I shouldn't have." So she's begun to see that the counselor is very very distracted. Is very um, not present with with her and you see how that has affected the way that she's even 
sharing her information. It's being cut in between, right? So, OK, so you've noticed that. Good. After we go through the class, I'll show you the, the rest of the clip, part of the clip of how uh, she is able to uh, respond and you know how, how that actually changes, OK? Uh, yeah, just give me a minute. Can I yeah, share? Yes, Divya, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, yeah. I I believe she was talking about the very thing that she is experiencing, right? Exactly. <laughs> Telling her husband is not paying attention to her. Uh, so the very thing that she is struggling with, she's experiencing here again. Yeah, that's yes. something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you will actually see that in the rest of the clip where the, you know, where the counselor has picked that up and she's actually saying something. So yeah, we'll see that. that that's good. That's an excellent observation, Divya. OK, sure. so we're, we're going to be looking at uh, different micro skills. But today, we will we will just be focusing on the skills of attending. But there are other skills of responding, questioning, facilitating, or influencing, which we will look into in detail as we move ahead. OK, so um, what is the purpose of the skills? Now, just as much as this word talks about it, you know, the word in itself gives you an understanding of what it means. Attending is to pay attention, is to show that you as a counselor uh, is interested in not just what is being said, but you're also interested in the person sitting right in front of you. So when you're attending to someone in a, in a way that's, that's positive, that's helpful, you're encouraging your client or your counselee to talk and it shows it it shows very clearly that the counselor has a certain interest in in what is happening in the life of the uh, of the counselee so the purpose of attending skills is to encourage your counselee to talk to to bring them to a place or give them a certain environment that helps them to open up that helps them to really share what they are going through okay now when are these attending skills used it's used throughout the entire counseling process and it's largely important in the beginning stages of your counseling because that's when you're establishing rapport because your first impression is the best impression so when uh, especially right in the beginning the the counselee who's who's there is actually keenly observing to see how much of connection they are being able to build with the counselor. So the, this, pro, this um, skill of attending is, is, is something that, that you know, it's important to build and to hone even when, when we are working with uh, counselors, uh, counselees. Okay? Now, attending skills, what is it? Like I said, it just means paying attention to. So you're paying keen attention to not just what they're saying, but maybe what they're doing, maybe also what they're not implying, you're paying very, very keen personal attention to that. Now, attending skills, can we can break it down into three, and we're going to be looking at it in these three different um, aspects, OK? Attending non-verbally and verbally. Uh, you, are, you attend by listening and you also attend by observing so there are so when you're looking at paying paying somebody or paying something attention there are these three uh, focus points it's just not it's not just not the words that you use okay it's also your body language maybe the way that you're sitting the way that you're looking at someone the way that you're conducting yourself the way that you listen and the way that you observe so all of this when it's being connected together, they really uh, help the counselee feel that the person is interested. So let's begin with this and um, uh, slowly begin to unpack. So the first one is attending non-verbally and verbally. So at, um, if, if you're looking at attending behavior, uh, as we saw, it's defined as where a, a, a place or a way to support your counselee with individual and culturally appropriate cues. Okay, so so it needs to be individually appropriate. It needs to be culturally also appropriate. Now, what do we mean by 
individually appropriate is um, there are a lot of times you can see, uh, you may be able to notice how your the, the individual, uh, the person sitting next to you, the counselor sitting next to you kind of behaves. Like, for example, you know, a counselor may come to you not really making complete eye to eye contact. They may be for whatever reason, and uh, we're not we're not going to look into why they are that way. We're just saying maybe they can't make eye to eye contact. They're always looking down, right? And they're, they're talking in and just little by little, they may give you a glance. Now, attending behavior, I've got to be careful how I attend to this person. Now, generally, when we know in counseling is when you're attending, you have good eye to eye contact, right? Now, this person, this individual who's sitting in front of you, if you're going to keep, you know, just keep your eyes focused on them throughout like that, they can have, they can feel uncomfortable, right? So depending on what you are seeing the, the individual do, you also kind of change your attention. So like, for example, when they're looking down, you're also got maybe a, a lowered glance and then quickly look up when they're looking up, right? Just to ensure that you're not making them uncomfortable. Or it should be culturally appropriate. Like in some cultures, maybe uh, you know, looking directly could mean like as if you're staring, you know, as if you are uh, you're you're really um, peering into their soul. All right. So that also is is you 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 get a certain um, feedback from your counselee themselves in the way that you need to attend. So you're basically helping to follow the cues, appropriate cues from the counselee itself. So it is to support your counselee with appropriate uh, cues. Okay, so it can be visual. So that's why it includes three Vs, which is visuals, which is vocal, verbal, and body language. So they're known as the three Vs and the B. So the visual eye contact or the vocal quality or the kind of verbal uh, tracking that you may use and your body language. Now, these aspects emphasize that, remember that we live, um, especially when, when, when we are looking, you know, uh, let's say, uh, and, and I'd like to speak for where, I, where I'm from, where we're from, in an Indian culture, we have, we have a real multicultural uh, um, clientele that comes, okay? And there may be certain actions, gestures, or things we may not see, uh, we may not, uh, things that we say or do may not be appropriate in all cultures or situations. Right, like for example, um, a handshake. Right, not everyone in maybe our Indian culture are used to the handshake. Maybe a lot more younger generation people may be used to the handshake. There may be some who say namaste or you know, kind of bend down and say so. Being careful as to how you initially also greet. So you need to be aware of what is culturally appropriate for your counselling. So if you're not aware of this, uh, you know, it, sometimes it can either make or it can break an interview. So it's always better if you're not um, sure to maybe ask, right? And, and it's per perfectly fine to ask that. So being careful of how you use these different, um, uh, these, these different skills, OK? So, in general, now even as we are looking at each of them in general, let, let's let's remember that we are we need to be sensitive across uh, the cultures. Okay, so when we look at visuals, uh, what we're looking at is an eye contact. How do we establish good eye contact? So maintaining a good eye contact is how a professional counselor conveys their interest. It conveys confidence. It con uh, conveys an involvement in your counselee story. Okay, so for those counselees who may have difficulty with closeness, making eye contact in itself can be just an important part of change. Okay, but when we're looking at eye contact, remember there should be natural breaks 
in your eye contact. You know, it, it, there should be a certain, you know, ebb and flow as you're collecting your thoughts and listening to your uh, counselee story. Remember to be careful not to stare, OK? Just not, not staring. So like, for example, when they're speaking or when you're saying something, you can actually look away and then look back in or uh, you know, uh, look onto the side and then look back in. So it, it's something that you, you, you learn to do as you keep going. Also, what's important is notice the breaks in eye contact on the part of your counseling. Sometimes they, they, they may tend to look away when they are discussing something that is very distressing towards them, right? So that gives you a clue, right? That gives you a lot more. You're, you're paying attention to what they're saying, but you're also looking at their body language in order to uh, help you get carry more information. Like, for example, let's say they're talking about some area and they're, they're maybe looking away or they're sitting, sitting this way. So you can say, I, I, I sense that you're extremely uncomfortable about this topic. Is that so? So, you know, you, they, get to, they get to understand that you, you've picked up uh, some, some significant distress that they're going through. Okay. So while it's it's excellent to maintain that eye contact when you are talking to a person, it can it can definitely be uncomfortable if you continue staring very intensely at them. So so generally, a principle that we use to break uh, to work through this is to break eye contact every five seconds or so. So that doesn't mean you say okay one two three four five one two three four five. That doesn't mean that okay. But you're you're. You're, you're careful about how long you are actually keeping or maintaining that uh, eye contact. So when you're breaking eye contact, you don't, uh, you know, you don't, um, you, you, you're, you're, what you're tending to do is that you probably look maybe a little to their side, um, you know, uh, like for example, without just moving your head, you could actually put your eyes down. I mean, you're not doing this, but you could just put your eyes down. So specifically, what they say is to be able to rotate from one eye to the other eye to the mouth, and then one eye to the other eye, so that you know you have like a like like a general rotation that is that's coming up. Okay, um, so it's it's important to be able to uh, to not stare and uh, making sure that you're also very careful in not uh, making them uncomfortable, either by completely looking away or by completely staring staring at them, OK? Um, so when you're listening, so specifically this happens when you're listening. That's what it means by listening, uh, use the triangle. So when you're listening, uh, you, you, the technique that you can use is you know, um, uh, to, to be able to look at one eye. And then about five seconds, look at the other eye for around five seconds, and then look at the mouth for five seconds, and keep on rotating in this way. So when you're doing this, what, what you're also doing is, uh, through this, you're also using certain other encouragers or other words. You may be, it, it's coupled with other listening skills, which is um, you know an agreement. You say, aha, uh -huh, OK, yes, mm, oh, that must be hard. So, the, so that's a great way to help the person to continue to talk. So it is essential to ensure that you are sensitive to this, even as um, you're practicing this entire skill. The next comes vocals. Okay, vocals is the kind of um, voice or modulation that you use. Now, emotions are conveyed uh, a lot frequently by your tone of voice the pitch that you use, the pace that you use, the volume that you use, it has an effect on how maybe you know your counselee responds emotionally to you. Okay. So like for example, when they're talking about something really excited, you know, you could the way that you said, oh wow, that was that's uh, you know that's that's really exciting. So you see, you know, you you've used a mod uh, um, uh, voice modulation, you've changed the pitch you know, you've gotten a, got into a different tone. But let's say they're talking about something maybe really difficult. So you could go into, I'm sorry, that must be really hard on you. So do you see that, you know, so depending on what they're saying, your voice can actually really create that sense of a soothing or an anxiety regulating atmosphere for the client, for, the, for your counseling. Eh? And what you are hoping to do is it's, it should also communicate warmth. 
it should communicate an interest and not boredom, right? Like, oh, is that so? Oh, that must be very hard on you. Well, that's very exciting. You know, it sounds it sounds boring, um, even even as you know, even as I'm hearing it. So you you can you use your voice as a, a tool for uh, you know through counseling, and um, to be careful because it like I said, the emotions are very very co uh, easily conveyed when you're speaking. I'm sure when you've spoken on the phone to someone, you can immediately understand if they're excited or not, right? Uh, but of course, there are people who can actually fake it really well. But nevertheless, uh, there is there's some, some a lot of information that you get by just uh, the, the modulation of the voice. Next is silence. Now, silence can uh, is, is a very powerful tool, even in, uh, in counseling. A lot of times, you know, um, counselors who begin feel, oh, I should not even have a second of silence, which means if I don't say something, then, you know, it's very odd. I can't, I can't bear with silence. But um, let's say the person's saying something and they've stopped. You can actually wait with silence because you are hoping that they are going to say more. And when you give them enough of silence, they may they may continue to share. Or let's say they're saying something that's maybe very painful, and they've stopped, right? And then they're crying, or they've broken down. The, uh, the tendency is for us to quickly say something. But allowing them that moment to maybe grieve, or to cry, or to feel that hurt, is extremely therapeutic. So silence is an excellent tool, right? Knowing when to speak, when to sit back is a great way um, as you're building the skin, OK? The other thing that you would do is what is called as verbal underlining. Verbal underlining is where you're giving um, vocal emphasis to certain words or or certain phrases. And what does it do? It's helping to convey a sense of empathic understanding. Oh, this must be really hard for you, right? Or you sound really excited, right? You know, so so some things when you're when you're bringing it up, it works to help them. It 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 connects with your counseling. There are also something that we call as encouragers or minimal encouragers. Now, minimal encouragers are repeats of certain words or phrases, like you're using certain prompts, like, uh-huh, OK, oh, yes, oh, right, oh, right? So all of that helps the counselee know that you are being heard, rather than when the counselee is telling you a story, you, you're you absolutely quiet on the other end. They're, like, they kind of probably ask you, are you with me? Or, uh, you know, have you, did you pick up what I said? You know, because they have, they're not getting a feedback from you. So these these vocal encouragers again are extremely helpful. Okay. Uh, next, when they're looking at verbal, you may find a little, uh, you know, overlap here and there. Okay. Uh, now the the key verbal tracking, uh, uh, verbal attending skill is what we call is verbal tracking. So verbal tracking means you are following your counselee stories. So the goal is to keep the dialogue going where the counselee is the lead rather than where you as the counselor wants to go. Okay, This is specifically important, especially at the beginning of counseling, because you know this is a period where counselees actually make their first impression of the counselor. So counselors often, generally in training, will begin to formulate questions in their mind regarding the stories of the counselee and actually really miss the dialogue that could be helpful in understanding the whole story. OK, uh, so it, this is this is a place where where you're really looking at how clients or, or your counselee really need to do most of the talking. So about 80 percent to 20 percent uh, 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 that, that should be taking place. So the clients do 80% and 20% is what the, the counselor does. 
the, so the skill here is picking up where the counselees have left off. Once your counselees pause or complete part of their stories, the counselor, you know, you, we must resist that temptation to ask too many quest questions or redirect the stories until they have had the opportunity to fully complete them. So the best way to do is uh, to, to, to do this is to stay focused on where they left off and urge them to continue, either by nodding your head or by acknowledging them or using those minimal encouragers. Okay, it helps them when you use verbal tracking, it helps them to stay on the topic um, which they have started. And when you're seldom interrupting them or changing topics, they are able to tell you more and part a, a lot uh, of, of part of their story. Okay, so, so that's why these, these three things, your verbal, vocal, as well as visual, gets connected one to another as you begin to, as you're helping to attend. Okay, um, let me stop here. Are there any questions? Any questions? Or any thoughts of how you have seen uh, it? You know, some of this work for you in your own personal experience of actually just talking to people. Now, these are excellent skills, communication building skills, even as you are talking. Yes, Divya, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the silence uh, mm -hmm. part. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, even in our normal conversations, if uh, you know uh, the other person listening to you is silent, and if uh, you are expecting a response and there is a silence, uh, sometimes it creates a kind of confusion, right? As you said, like whether they got what you said, what you were trying to convey or uh, so does that happen uh, in the silence that's hmm. that's what i was trying to understand okay so uh, even when you're using silence you're also uh, very conscious about the cues that you're getting from your counselee like for example they're saying a part of the story and they've abruptly stopped let's say they've abruptly stopped you may wait for a couple of seconds because you're waiting for them to continue, right? And you know that something has gone wrong. So you can check that. You can say, um, I see that you you did stop. Is is there something wrong? Or um, you know, can I help you with something? Uh, what happened? You seem to have remembered something. So depending on the situation, if the silence is... It, 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 it also matters where you're using the silence, right? So, so let's say they're telling the story and they've abruptly stopped. Or they've said a story and they've almost come to an end of something, right? So you use a bit of silence because, like, um, I'll give you an example. Um, mm, so this counts, this counsel, counsel is saying, uh, you know, I, I really want to manage my emotions and my thoughts very well. Uh, I... I really want to know how to build boundaries. But she's only said that much, OK? And then you wait, OK? Because you know that there is some story behind what she wants to tell you. But maybe this is the first time. I'm talking about this is the first time she's come to see me, and she's given me these two, three sentences, OK? And, and I don't have, a, don't have a background of a story at all. So then I waited. So, so then I, so what I did is give her a couple of seconds, and then I said, "Okay, I see that you really want to sort these two things out, your emotions and learn how to build boundaries." Did I hear that right? She said, "Yes." I said, "Okay," and I, I said, "Okay," and I stopped. And then she said, "Yeah, I think you need to know a background of what I'm saying, right?" So if I had gone way ahead and said, OK, then tell me what are the emotions you feel. Now, she would have gone to say, OK, I feel sadness. I feel this. I feel that. And she has not got a chance to tell me her story. right? But because of maybe I gave her enough time, that silence, to help her to retract, maybe she was just trying me out. She was just trying to see 
how comfortable can I be in talking to this person? That's what she was probably doing, right? So when once maybe she said, okay, that I've understood, I, I, all I did was I just reworded what she said. And that these are the two things that seem important to you. Is that right? So she said, yeah, it is. OK. I just said that. And then she said, OK, but but this, this, this. So so it, what they're doing also in a situation would probably try to see how you're judging them. Like this is something that often happens is maybe a counselee is crying. And they begin to feel extremely uncomfortable that they're crying. So I'm so sorry that I've broken down. I'm so embarrassed and all of that. So being silent over there is not appropriate because if you're being silent over there it it almost means like you're you're uh, agreeing with what your counselee just said right so then i said oh, oh i i know that's making you uncomfortable but you have the space and the freedom to do that and i and i'm here with you as you are as you are emoting so please take your time you know if you need to cry please take your time i'm here with you right so that Something like that really may help. Or let's say your counselee is crying as well as she's saying a story. She's sobbing and she's crying and she's telling a story after story. In between, maybe to blow her nose or something, she stopped. You don't have to say a question that, you know, you can you can just say, Yeah, this seems this seems hard for you, right? Because that's encouraging her. It encourages her to maybe say something. But then I'm using just a couple of encouragers to continue that. And maybe then say then adding on going ahead with with a silence. Does that does that help, uh, with the, uh, Divya? Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. All right. So um, okay. Before we get into the next uh, slide, we'll we'll break. It's at ten forty nine. We'll come back at eleven o'clock. We'll have a break and get back in ten minutes. <laughs> 